The disciples, along with Jesus, have just returned to Bethany, about two miles outside of Jerusalem. There, Jesus is invited to a meal at the home of a man named Simon the leper. During that meal, an unnamed woman, according to Mark, approaches Jesus with a very expensive gift and gives it to him. This provokes outrage among the disciples, but a beautiful blessing from Jesus Christ. Welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. James Jones, the pastor of the DeRitter Presbyterian Church in DeRitter, Louisiana. I'm glad you're worshiping with us today. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we study today what true devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ entails, we pray that the Holy Spirit would enable us to understand these things, and also by your grace and through faith in Jesus to put these things into practice in our lives as well. Please forgive our sins. We ask all of this in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Hear the Word of God. We come today to Mark chapter 14. We're going to read the first 11 verses. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, Not during the feast lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor." And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Amen. This is God's inspired and inerrant word. May he add his wonderful blessings to our reading and hearing and understanding of it today. With the beginning of chapter 14, we come to the final hours of Jesus' life on earth. This is the beginning of the time that leads up to his crucifixion. And Mark tells us that after two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, according to the Old Testament, the Passover was always to be celebrated on the 14th day of the month of Nisan. At that time, in the afternoon, a Passover lamb was chosen and was held aside. And then when the new day began, which would have been 6 p.m. on that day, the 15th day of Nisan began, the Passover lamb was taken and was slaughtered. The blood was taken from the lamb and was sprinkled on the doorposts of the faithful in remembrance of what had been done in the Passover from Egypt. And then the lamb was roasted and eaten with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. The bitter herbs recalled the bitterness of the slavery for 450 years in Egypt of the uh, Israelite people. And the uh, unleavened bread indicated the haste with which they were to eat this meal. God had told them to put their traveling clothes on. Uh, to have a staff in hand and to be ready to leave at any moment. And so the Passover was to be eaten uh, and prepared in haste and to be ready uh, for the people to depart on that first Passover day. And so all of this was done in preparation. Now, this was followed. The, the Passover was the 15th of Nisan. This was followed by a week-long feast that was known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so on the 21st day of the month, that feast was over and worship was celebrated once again. 
in the parlance of the common people in Jesus' day, the Passover followed by the entire week of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was spoken of as the Passover or the Passover meal or the Passover feast. And this under, explain, explains to us how we can understand that Jesus and his disciples did eat the Passover, but that the leaders of the Jews are concerned that they will be able to eat the Passover. Apparently, they are referring to the continuation of this feast throughout the entire week. And so uh, all of the Jews would have eaten uh, the Passover meal on the evening uh, that began the 15th of Nisan, which is when Jesus and his disciples uh, do this. And so Mark tells us that the events that are taking place here are uh, a couple of days prior to the Passover beginning. That would make it the 12th of Nisan. Mark tells us that at that time, the chief priest and the scribes began in earnest to plot to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. They were trying to take him by trickery and put him to death. Now, they had sought him throughout his ministry. Uh, they had been opposed to him. They confronted him. But now uh, they are seeking a way to capture him so that they can kill him. And they plan to do this by trickery. Uh, that's a term that has to do with a decoy that would be used in hunting. Uh, those of you who are duck hunters might know what it would be like to put out a, a decoy duck to try to lure other ducks to a pond or uh, a decoy of other animals so that uh, the prey is unaware of the danger. And this is what the uh, chief priest and the scribes are attempting to do. They're trying to use some type of decoy to lure Jesus out so that they can capture him. Now their plan is to kill him. They're not going to capture Jesus in order to interrogate him, to find out who he says he is and what he says he is. They have predetermined already that he is a blasphemer, that he ought to die. And so they're simply seeking a convenient way to trap him so that they might kill him. The leader of this plot, according to the scriptures, was a man by the name of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. In the gospel according to John, we read these words in John chapter 11. Then the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. And so we're told a few more details here in the gospel according to John. We're told that it's Caiaphas who instigates this entire thing, that he is the one who unintentionally prophesies the death of Christ. Uh, God is able to take this man who had wicked motives, who had uh, an unredeemed heart, who had hatred and animosity toward the Lord Jesus Christ, and God is able to use him to prophesy that his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would die for the nation and not for that nation only, but for the people of God. And so he would die for the elect of God, both Jews and Gentiles. Caiaphas prophesies this, not even knowing that this is what he is prophesying. Their only concern, however, is not that they might be luring an innocent man to his death, but rather that a riot might take place. They said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. You see, the only problem that they're concerned about here is something that might happen if they arrested Jesus in public. And that's because Jesus still, at this particular moment in time, was a popular figure among the common people. And so they, fear, they feared that his arrest in public might trigger a riot of some kind and that the riot would in turn bring down the wrath of Rome upon them. Notice what we 
read in the gospel according to John, that the Romans would come and take away our place and nation. The place was the temple. And so they feared that if they arrested Jesus in public uh, during the feast, during the Passover uh, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that a riot would ensue, uh, that uh, the Romans would send an army to uh, quell the riot, and that they might destroy uh, the city. And so this was their fear, their main fear. During the Passover, the city of Jerusalem, which normally housed about 50,000 inhabitants, swelled to about 250,000 when people came from all over the Roman Empire uh, to come to Jerusalem uh, to worship during the Passover meal. And so uh, they were afraid that this great uh, crowd would turn into a mob and that the mob would then riot. There were quite a number of zealots and during this time of uh, the history, uh, there were people who tried to raise insurrections against Rome in Jerusalem and in Judea. We read about false prophets and false messiahs last chapter, last time. And so uh, we understand that this was a genuine concern that a riot would take place, and in fact does later on, not when they arrest Jesus, but uh, later between here and the year 70, uh, there are riots that do take place, and eventually Rome does send its army. Now, they're concerned then about the Romans uh, coming and uh, believing that a riot is about to ensue and uh, attacking the city and destroying the temple and doing away uh, with the nation of Israel. And so that's their main concern. They don't care whether or not Jesus is guilty or innocent. They don't care about luring an innocent man to his death. They care about the political outcome that would affect them. As the enemies of Jesus plot his downfall, we read an account of a woman who worships the Lord Jesus Christ in a remarkable way. Jesus and his disciples are still on the Mount of Olives where he had given the Olivet Discourse that we read in the last chapter. And now he and they retire to the home of a man by the name of Simon the leper in the town of Bethany, which is about two miles from Jerusalem. As far as Simon the leper goes, we don't know anything about him other than uh, what is stated here in the Gospel of Mark and also in Matthew. Uh, we know his name and that's about all that we know. But the way that Mark writes of him indicates that perhaps uh, the church in Rome to whom Mark is writing this Gospel probably knew him, which means that by that time, uh, this man, Simon the leper, had become a prominent member of the church and perhaps even a leader of the church in Jerusalem. Simon the leper indicates that he was formerly a leper. Uh, if he continued to be a leper, he would not have been able to live in the town. He would have had to be outside the town, and he would not have been able to entertain any guest whatsoever. And so we assume, probably correctly, that Jesus has healed Simon of his leprosy, although he is still known as Simon the leper. And so they are invited to this man's home, and there are a number of people who are present. Jesus is there, the 12 disciples are there, and in comes an unnamed woman uh, with a very costly gift. She has a jar with her. The jar is made out of alabaster, which itself is an extremely expensive jar, and it contains a very expensive oil, a perfume, uh, by the name of spikenard. Now, uh, who is this woman? Mark does not tell us, but John does. In John's gospel, this woman is identified as Mary. Mary, the sister of Martha and of Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. This Mary uh, comes in uh, in uh, the gospel according to John, and she anoints Jesus' feet with oil and wipes them with her hair. Uh, is there a discrepancy here? Because Mark tells us that she poured the oil of uh, spikenard on Jesus' head. No, there is not. Uh, this jar was not a tiny little thing. We're not talking about a, a one-ounce perfume bottle that you might today buy in a department store. We're talking about a pound, according to uh, the Gospel of John, a pound of spikenard. That would have been anywhere from 12 to 16 ounces. It's quite a bit 
of uh, this very expensive oil. Spikenard uh, is made from an oil that comes from a plant that's found in India. And so uh, importing it and treating it and making perfume out of it was an expensive process. To have an entire pound of this, this uh, large jar, uh, meant that this was an extremely expensive gift. Most likely what this was, was uh, Mary's uh, entire future security. This was undoubtedly a family heirloom. Uh, it undoubtedly had been passed on from generation to generation, from mother to daughter, as something that would be a nest egg, something that uh, that woman could fall back on if times became very difficult. And so she would have something to live on. And so this represents, in, in one sense, uh, Mary's entire life savings. This represents her entire future security. She takes it, she has to break the jar, and so uh, this, this alabaster flask has to be broken open, uh, which was normally what was done with uh, these types of things. And then she pours this on Jesus' head. And there's so much oil that apparently it runs down from his head onto his feet. And then John records how she wiped his feet with her hair. Uh, remember, Mary is the one that we encounter who uh, sits at Jesus' feet and learns from him. She is uh, a woman who has uh, listened to the Lord Jesus Christ on many occasions. Uh, she has uh, faithfully uh, followed after him, and now because she trusts in him, she is willing to commit to him this lavish gift. And so she who sat at the feet of Jesus and learned from him sits at his feet once again and wipes his feet with her hair. She anoints him uh, with this uh, costly perfume. Sinclair Ferguson said this in his commentary, In gratitude for the past, she poured her future and her security on Jesus. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment because that's one of the important things of what it means to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This act of faith triggered a, an outrageous response from the crowd that was there. Mark tells us that there were some there who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? It might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. And so there is this immediate uproar among the guests. Some of them, and this included some of the disciples, if not all of the disciples, uh, took offense at this gesture of faith by Mary. They become indignant. And this is a term that means they were furious at her. And their argument is, this is a waste of money. This perfume is very expensive. It could have been sold for 300 denarii, which would have been a year's wages. Uh, this would have been uh, the entire uh, year's wages for a common working man. And they're saying that's how much this was worth, that this is a waste. And so they criticize Mary's actions sharply. Uh, but we learn that uh, at least... In the case of Judas Iscariot, this criticism is not genuine. His outrage is not sincere. John chapter 12 tells us, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and used to take what was put in it. And so Judas was the treasurer for the disciples and Judas had sticky fingers and when money was given to the group, uh, he would skim some off the top. And so Judas wanted this money put into the treasury so that he could get some of it, if not all of it, for himself. So the, the critics of Mary continued to react in this very negative way toward her. Mark says they criticized her sharply. And this is a term that means that they were so angry that their nostrils were flaring like a raging wild animal. In other words, they are so upset with her. They criticize her so sharply that they are snorting with anger at her over this act, this gesture of her faith in Christ. 
Jesus' response is entirely different. He said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? And so what Jesus does is he rebukes her rebukers. He orders them to leave her alone, and he commends her actions as being a good work done for him. He says, in a remarkable way, they will always have the poor with them, but they will not always have him with them. Now, the contrast is not between Jesus and the poor, but the contrast is uh, between the time of opportunity that they will have. The poor will always be with them, and at any time they can do them good. They can practice acts of charity toward the poor. Uh, basically what Jesus is saying is the poor will never depart from the face of the earth until he comes again. Sinful, fallen human beings cannot eliminate poverty, no matter how hard we try. And so there will always be occasions to help the poor. But there will not always be an occasion to, to do something for Jesus. That window of opportunity is closing and closing fast. And so uh, what uh, Mary has done for him is something that could only be done at that time. There was not going to be a further opportunity at all. Uh, she takes this oil, she anoints him. And what is being said by Jesus here is that he will not always be on earth. There will always be the poor on the earth. But he is ready to depart. He is going to go by way of the cross and death and resurrection and ascension to heaven. And there he will remain away from us until he comes again on the last day as the judge of the living and the dead. And so what Jesus does is he commends Mary for her action. He says she has done what she could. She has anointed his body for burial in advance. The normal Jewish custom of that day was to uh, take a, a dead body and to anoint it before uh, it was uh, placed into a tomb. This was not done for Jesus. In fact, it was never done for convicted and executed criminals. Uh, what happened to the two criminals, the two thieves who were uh, crucified on either side of Jesus? Their bodies were taken down according to Roman custom. And they were taken to the valley of the sons of Hinnom. We know it as Gehenna. And there, their dead bodies were tossed into the trash. The valley of the sons of Hinnom, Gehenna, was the trash heap for the city of Jerusalem. And so these bodies were never buried. They were never anointed. They were just tossed out with the trash. This did not happen to Jesus, however. And it didn't happen to Jesus because, as we will see as we go through the account here, uh, Joseph of Arimathea asks for Jesus' body. He takes him, his body down and places Jesus' body in an unused tomb that he owned. Uh, this is in keeping with the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53 that says that he would be with a rich man in his death. And so uh, all of this happens in accordance with prophecy. Jesus' body did not have time to be anointed uh, after his death. And so uh, Mary has anointed Jesus' body in advance in preparation for his death. Now, she doesn't, doesn't know that. But the disciples don't understand that. But Jesus says, this is what has happened indeed. Uh, she has come to him. She has exhibited great faith in him as her savior. He has forgiven her sins. She knows that. He is the redeemer. She knows that. And he, uh, she has come and, and by this act of giving him her all, her future security, she has placed her entire life in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she is giving him worship by giving him her most prized possession. And Jesus accepts that gift as a gift of worship. Uh, he accepts it as this great gift that it actually is. In fact, uh, her gift to him is a gift to the poor in the ultimate sense. Because we read in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, what that's getting at is the fact that Jesus is rich as, as God. He is rich beyond belief as the creator and sustainer of all things. And yet, he took upon himself a human body. He became poor 
Uh, he wasn't born in a, a, a palace. He wasn't born uh, to the lineage of the kings in Jerusalem. He was born in Bethlehem, yes, to the lineage of David, to the lineage of the kings. Uh, but he was not born in luxury. He was born in poverty. And so uh, he became poor for our sakes, for our salvation. And therefore, uh, Mary has offered a, a gift to the ultimate poor man who is the one who makes us rich in faith and in salvation by his great work. And Jesus says what she has done will be told wherever the gospel is preached in the whole earth. And it is told today as we read this message today. We read of this wonderful gift that Mary gave to her Lord and Savior. It's a testimony of her faith uh, it stood as a testimony of her faith back then. It stands as a testimony of her faith today. And it will stand as a testimony of her faith on the day of judgment to come. In contrast to her great faith, we see the vile unbelief of Judas Iscariot. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. Now, we've seen that Judas was among those who were upset, who disliked Mary's devotion to Christ. And he disliked it because he could not understand it. His mindset was like the mindset of all unbelievers. He was materialistic to the core. He is unable to comprehend what spiritual, true devotion to the Savior actually encompasses. He doesn't understand how anybody could be devoted to Christ other than for what he would get out of this. And so Judas simply wants to get his hand on the money that's represented by this gift. He is outraged that as far as he's concerned and others as well, that this money has been wasted. And so uh, it's at this point that he determines that he will betray the Lord Jesus. His, his uh, disillusionment with Christ, at least, peaks at this time. And so he's heard that the Sanhedrin wants to get their hands on Jesus and he voluntarily goes and tells them, I will give him up. I will betray him if you will pay me money. And so he is ready to hand Jesus over to them uh, and to their schemes at this time. The members of the Sanhedrin must have danced for joy when Judas told them that he would give Jesus up. I mean, after all, here is one of the twelve, one of the most intimate followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is one who is willing to give him up. And therefore, they are excited about this. And so they promise to give him the money that he is asking for. They had been looking for somebody to betray Jesus. They wanted somebody who would uh, show, be able to point out to whoever arrests Jesus that this is Jesus and not some imposter, not someone else. And so having a, a, a man from the inner circle of Jesus' followers uh, able to point Jesus out to the arresting officers is important to them. And therefore, they are full of glee and they give Judas the money. They promise him the money. They give it to him. Uh, we're going to see later on it's uh, the uh, cost of a slave, 30 pieces of silver. Uh, Judas accepts this, and then uh, the Bible tells us that he looks for a convenient time to betray him. He seeks how he might betray him conveniently. He begins to plot at this point to find a, an easy, a convenient way to betray Jesus. He's looking for an opportunity where there will not be large crowds who would favor Jesus, uh, who would be among his followers. Uh, he's looking for an opportunity and a time when he can easily capture Jesus and turn him over. Uh, now the problem the enemies of uh, Jesus and, and Judas faced was they could not understand faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, like uh, Mary, unlike Mary, who committed herself and her future to the Savior, they were not able to see and to understand anything like that. In fact, what they see in Jesus is a hindrance to getting what they want. The Sanhedrin wanted what? They wanted political power over the people, and Jesus was standing in that way. He was gathering a following, and he was a threat to their political power, and so they wanted him removed. Judas wanted money. 
And here Jesus is not concerned about wealth at all. And he, Judas cannot comprehend this. And so uh, he uh, thinks that uh, accepting Mary's lavish gift and not rebuking her and not trying to get money out of her uh, is, is an unfathomable, unfathomable thing for him. He does not comprehend it at all. Uh, and so Judas is asking himself the question, obviously, what do I get out of all of this? And not being able to answer that question to his satisfaction, he decides that he will give up Jesus. Uh, and so he's determined, however, to make one last bit of profit out of this. And so he demands money uh, for betraying Jesus Christ. So we see priorities here that are completely the opposite. Mary's priority was to give her all to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that meant to entrust her entire being, her entire future, her entire security into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, to give him uh, her most lavish gift, to give him her most prized possession, entrusting herself entirely into his care. But the enemies of Christ, Judas and the Sanhedrin, they don't comprehend that. Their priorities are materialistic. Their priorities are bound to this earth. What can we get out of this? How can we make uh, greater uh, strides in our political power here on earth? How can we make more money here on earth? And so uh, they do not comprehend anyone who could ever put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. Uh, they are clueless and they are full of outrage and hatred and enmity toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, where do you stand on all of this? Where are your priorities? Are you a materialist? Are you committed to the things here below? Are you committed to the earth? Are you committed perhaps to the church, but only for what you get out of it? Or are you like Mary and are you committed to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, willing to give up your all for Him, to trust all that you are and all that you have into His hands, knowing that He is the only one who can secure your future for you. If you have never trusted in Christ before, trust in Him now. Because He is the only one who can secure this life and the future to come for you. Uh, don't trust in Him, however, because of what you get out of it. Trust in Him because He is God. He is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. He is worthy of your faith. He is worthy of your trust. He and He alone. And so trust in Him today. Flee from your sins. And put your faith in Christ. Amen. Let us pray once more. Almighty and gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for the things that we have learned from your holy word today. We thank you for this example of great devotion shown by Mary in giving her most prized possession to Christ and trusting her entire future and her entire security to Him. Father, we see the example of Judas, the enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Sanhedrin who plot to kill him, uh, who uh, want to betray him. And Lord, we pray that uh, you would keep us from being like them and that you would enable us to have that type of faith that Mary exhibits in this passage before us today. And so, Lord, my prayer is for any listening or watching today who are apart from Christ, that you might grant to them by the work of your Spirit a heart that exercises such devotion and such faith to Christ that that person gives all to the Lord Jesus. Bring this about for your honor and glory, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you for being with me this week. And I look forward to bringing the Word of God again next time.